Okay, welcome to Fu Manchu University. Uh, here we are at the fireside. Uh, and I'd like to, of course, we don't light that fire because we're in Florida and we have the presence of mind to understand <laughs> that it's, it's far too hot <laughs> here in, in uh, Florida to be lighting fireplaces. Uh, but it's a nice sort of artifice to have in our home. This is my cat here, Ponce de Leon, uh, walking through. Uh, but what we'd like to do today is talk about a book here called uh, Red Roulette uh, by the author Dennis Schum. Uh, I was just able to finish this book yesterday. Uh, I sat down one reading and got through it. Uh, my familiarity comes from, once again, um, China Uncensored, had a, or actually China Unscripted. Uh, I had a long uh, video on YouTube speaking with Dennis Schum, or Desmond, I'm sorry, Desmond Schum. And also, 60 Minutes Australia did a piece on this, and I think I want to say here it's it's really important that people, if you're going to read this book, uh, definitely um, definitely take a look at that 60 Minutes piece because there's some really pertinent information in that piece that uh, isn't in the book, and it's really sort of a, the afterward. Uh, it's really sort of essential information concerning the release of this book and his wife. Now, the book itself is about. Uh, is uh, about Desmond Shum's um, Shum, uh, story. Uh, he was a, um, a Chinese citizen who kind of rose to wealth and preeminence and even in power in the Chinese uh, Communist Party, the CCP. Uh, but he was never red aristocrat. Red aristocrats are people who are directly related to uh, members uh, of the party who were affiliated to the revolution. And really that's sort of the heart of the CCP, is this um, kind of basically nepotism. And that also draws a parallel in our own American government as we see more and more sort of relatives, you know, the Bushes, the Bush dynasty, people trying to sort of um, promote that idea of, of uh, nepotism, which, you know, is in the Constitution, is, is kind of forewarned against. But that's essentially what what uh, the CCP runs on, and what you find is like, the, you know, all the corruption is actually what made it more appear more <laughs> more democratic. You know, uh, essentially the CCP because it has that central sort of body, that central sort of core of just basically people related to the revolution, um, revolutionaries, the red aristocrats. Um, it's all that other sort of corruption around it that has actually made it appear more democratic, or made it more democratic, which is kind of made me think a little bit about when I spoke uh, about In Order to Live, the, the uh, book by Yami Park, and that idea of being able to reconcile, you know, uh, sort of democracy, how it's perceived in the West today, and where she came from, the authoritarian re regime of North uh, Korea. But anyway, this, once again, this book is about Desmond Shum and uh, his wife, you know, he rose to wealth and, you know, immense wealth in China uh, during sort of the, I don't know, the second great leap, you might say, uh, or when capitalism sort of became more sort of um, endemic in China. And it ended up with him sort of leaving China and his wife disappearing, uh, being disappeared for a period of time. Uh, my first thoughts on the book, amazingly familiar. You know, like I've said, I've spent 10 years in China, and this book kind of just confirms a lot of the insights that I, I had, um, not only about Chinese people, but about people in general. You know, uh, Desmond Shun, um, really, in, in this entire book, he, he's, he talks a lot about, like, you know, friends, you know, this idea of relationships are really sort of, it's very transitory, and it's not something to invest too much of your, I guess your heart in, you know. He just kind of at the end of the book and the afterward, he kind of suggests love is, has changed his point of view, but he never really sort of says how or why, you know. Really the whole book is, is full of this, is for this demeanor of like how alienated you really are in life. And, uh, you know, I, I, I feel that, you know, that's my same sort of, you know, having had you know, this idea of deeper, he talks, you know, he talks about his wife trying to say, like, you need deeper relationships, and, uh, you know, his position is like, there, that's all bunk, you know, because even deeper relationships will throw you in the bus, and, and my own personal experience kind of shares that, you know, like, I've had, 
you know, family members, friends for 30 years, they will throw you under the bus when something new or more advantageous comes along. They will definitely throw you under the bus. And so like this idea of seeking deeper relationships just seems sort of self-defeating in, in a lot of ways. It's just kind of a con game, really. But at the same time, you know, like that's the, that sort of like crass perspective of relationships is just how business is done in China. You know, it's like you're supposed to go in there seeking deeper relationships with people. And you're supposed to try and establish them through like the most superficial, you know, like, you know, like frat boy kind of way, you know, drinking parties and all that. And he goes into that quite a bit uh, with the Muay Thai, you know, being so central to it. You know, you're supposed to go into all these relationships trying to make this sort of a, you know, familial uh, relationship and, and at the same time you're supposed to hold in the other half a year sort of hard is like this is not going to lead to anything you know this is going to be this is something I can't trust in the end anyway I'm really still on my own you know no matter what uh, so it's kind of interesting you know him as a person is somebody I, I kind of feel like I, I'm very familiar with I'm very know and it's kind of strange because like if you if you looked at my own personal the data out there that's available, I mean, uh, you know, there's certain things that are just congruent with my own life, you know, oddly, you know, sort of celestially. <laughs> uh, like he talks about this, this Half Moon Cafe in uh, Hong Kong, or no, actually in Beijing, I think. And uh, that's amazing to me because, you know, that's where I got my first gig. If you, if you look at my video uh, for the Long Lost Friends song, I, I speak about the Half Moon Cafe, but my Half Moon Cafe was in Schenectady, you know, and I, and I made this video, this song, thinking of the owner, this guy Richard, who I, you know, I had known for quite a period of time, and how he gave me my first gig, and so I wrote, and how I, you know, I went back to the Half Moon Cafe at that time, many years later, and, uh, you know, I just kind of felt uh, endeared uh, by seeing these people again. But uh, he talks about that in here. He also talks about an instance where somebody comes up. Uh, his father used to beat him relentlessly, and, and you know I'm familiar with that in China. You know, like China, Chinese people can be very severe on their children. And I recall just as you know, recent as 2020, um, 2019, 2020, that when I was living in Xinjiang, you know, the one of the people below me in my apartment building was just relentlessly going after their child you know I would just hear him screaming and yelling and her and the woman screaming and yelling and I can only assume that she was beating him and, and you know like most people I was just kind of like hoping for it to stop you know uh, that was just kind of sort of a temporal disciplinary uh, measure but it just was relentless to the point that I had to go down there and say something and, and at least see if the boy was okay you know, and I recall very vividly, you know, how shocked she was to see a foreigner. And I knew I, I would be jeopardizing my position because it's, you know, it's that position that you get even here in America. Who are you to tell me how to raise my children? But on top of that, like, who is a foreigner to tell, you know, to tell me how to raise my children? Uh, but I just kind of said, I want to see if the boy is okay. He didn't seem to have any sort of welts or anything on his face. This was kind of also during the COVID. 19 um, and uh, but anyway you just so that happened you know like like I said uh, you know being a foreigner in China like you're even jeopardizing your position even more by doing such things because they can you know she could have very easily went to the school and, and so this foreigner is you know disrupting to our harmony or something like that you know? or go to the elders you know and they would convey it to the school and so on and so forth but uh, but I just felt like as a, you know, just in terms of, you know, concern for the, the well-being of a child that, that it, it had risen to that point, risen to the point where I needed to sort of go and check on this boy and stop it. Uh, and he's appeared okay, and I said, you know, just, I want to see if he's got okay, you know. And anyway. But anyway, Desmond Shum talks about that, you know, he had that experience too as a child and, and he was grateful for a neighbor who came down and, uh, and did sort of uh, interfere, I guess, did sort, of, um, did sort of check on him and, tell the, and sort of um, mitigate that sort of, uh, dis, that sort of uh, 
somebody who did step in and, and kind of stop it. And he's, he's uh, grateful for that, so I feel uh, it's good to hear that. You know, it's good to hear that uh, and to think that maybe that boy, uh, because I remember very clearly this, this sort of shock look that there's this foreigner seeing if I wants to see if I'm okay, you know. Uh, it's good to hear that, uh, even if it isn't me. But anyway. Um, otherwise, it's, you know, this, this is an amazing amount of information here, you know, a lot of the things I underline and, and, uh, and discuss and sort of pull out of this book. If you really want to kind of know how, you know, Xi Jinping and rose to power, it gave me a lot of insight on that, uh, sort of what was going on between Bo Xi Lai and, and Xi Jinping and how they were kind of the two, the princelings, kind of vying for the head position of the CCP, and how they took it in another direction. Um, once again, sort of just kind of sort of, um, you know, pulling ranks and sort of, um, caught, you know, sort of um, reinforcing the idea of the red aristocrat being the sort of um, controlling faction of China, you know, and it doesn't matter if you're no matter what your wealth or status is, or an entrepreneur, they're, how they uh, just really sort of are focusing on a kind of nepotistic sort of added, which would, you know, which sort of definitely sort of is that Chinese characteristic of being an emperor of dynasties, you know. Um, and just really, you know, communism is just a system for sort of facilitating that by using this, you know, rhetoric of the people. And uh, I guess you see that in the the, uh, the uh, <laughs> Democrats, but there's, there's so many things in here that just kind of bring back China to me, you know. Uh, and that was kind of a good thing. Um, just some of the Chinese people I knew and their attitudes. Uh, I thought this was hilarious when it, you know about the. Um, I thought this was hilarious about uh, the uh, what's his name, Kwong, uh, Grandpa Kwong, uh, how he was sort of the. Uh, the administrator of the Civil Aviation Administration, and his character just kind of made me crack up in this way. He sort of uh, gave approval for, he gave his chop, or he gave his approval for sort of pro certain projects. It was just hilarious. He just kind of, they didn't even bother to look at the people who just did this, and then you knew you were kind of through, through the door. I thought that was hilarious. Um, just a lot of the insights in this, in this book are, are, are just things that I, I, I sort of perceive myself in, in the Chinese sort of, you know, I, I always kind of felt like these are people who have really, they've had a lot of time to sort of look at humanity through the filter of the social structure. And it's given them a lot of insight into how people work. And, and there's this dichotomy of like, you are on your own, but you're all working for the same purpose, you know? Uh, and that doesn't always sort of work. Um, right, in the vagary, uh, page 270, I heard, learned that friendships aren't reliable, nor are marriages, what kind of relationship is left, you know, and I don't really feel like he really actually resolves that in the book. He does talk about love in the end, and the afterward, but he never sort of says how it's any different from his relationship with his first wife, who disappeared, was disappeared. Um, he talks about uh, you know things like the shock and awe, hospitality of China, and that was kind of a phrase I thought it came up on my own. Um, the shock and hall, shock and awe banquet. You know, when I was in China, very frequently, whether it was me by myself or me with a bunch of foreigners, you, you always realize that your host, they would always have like a kind of shock and awe banquet to kind of you know when you're being introduced to whatever you school or university you're working with, and I call it shock and awe because. You you know like they 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 knew I mean it's like they they know Western sensibilities you know and they know there's certain dishes that in Chinese food that you know are that are sort of um, that are uh, that Western that are kind of easy on Westerners' palate you know are more sort of akin to Western palates like Gong Pao Ji Di you know so you kind of like a lot, of, like in some banquets, you, the host will be like considerate of that and put, you know, you'll get the gung pao GD or, or just like, you know, sliced chicken or something like that. 
plate of chicken or something like that and then you know like when I'm with other foreigners very often that's the plates that they, they, they gravitate toward but a lot of times you'll be with a host who'll just be putting stuff out there that are just like bizarre to your taste buds and I have this vivid memory of this, this gelatinous kind of fish that that was just so so it was just so just so foreign to my palate you know it was like jello it was like that same sort of you know how you take jello in your mouth and you swish it around well, this was a piece of fish and uh, it was a kind of fish and, and it was like sandy like it was like gritty and sandy but like it went in your mouth like this gelatinous cube and then you swished it and it became like a wiggling with like gritty pieces in it and I was just like wow this is terrible <laughs> But I called it the shock and all banquet because, you know, they would just put stuff in front of you that you were like, oh, all right, I'll try this, you know. Uh, and I guess it's, you know, just kind of a, I don't know, sometimes it's for fun, so sometimes it's kind of like to weigh your sort of sensibilities out. Um, a lot of information in here. I mean, he, he's lived an amazing life in terms of wealth, you know, going from, you know, one of those kind of grungy hutongs to, you know, four season penthouses and things like that. Um, and this is typical a lot of the Chinese nouveau rich, you know. Uh, he, keeps a, he keeps a good, it seems like he keeps, a, he kept his, his uh, you know, he kept a good perspective on it. He was able to sort of navigate it uh, to a great degree. Um, but his wife, uh, I guess kind of fell under it, and and here's where the 60 minutes piece is so relevant, uh, and why I suggest to you take a look at it because his wife actually called him, even though she'd been disappeared for two or three years. Uh, a few days before this book was being released, his, he actually got a call from his wife, and it's telling. It's kind of interesting to see his his reaction to it. You know, it's like an ex-girlfriend. You know that suddenly wants to be a part, you know, like suddenly acts like they want to be a part of your life again. And he's kind of like, who are you kidding? You know, like, what? You know, like who are you kidding now? You know, it's like, you, you disappeared for half of my life and, and now you're trying to like re bring yourself back into it, you know? Like life is, you know, I've moved on. And uh, so I, I definitely see, I suggest that people take a look at that 60 minute piece. It's very sort of uh, revealing and very sort of uh, relevant to this book, you know, it's a, it sort of resolves one of the big sort of um, questions that this book is left with, what happened to his wife. And I also recall like a conversation I had kind of very early, actually in Wuhan, <laughs> with somebody, uh, a Chinese student of mine, about friendship, you know, and this idea like, can people really be friends? I think that was a conversation we had. We both kind of, kind of agreed, like, no, you know, like, people are just gonna, and that's like the heart of Guanxi, is like, no, people are just gonna kind of use you and, and they're gonna expect some sort of deep, you know, like, the only way they can sort of feel comfortable with that is to get you on, you know, the same card get you at the same card table you know it's like we're going to play cards here but uh you know we better all be friends at this card because you don't want you know <laughs> take too much risk you know <laughs> that's about it uh interesting story here uh so you just got to go through right? there's a lot of trying to try again look to if she's changed for the basically Oh, yeah. The Chinese, you know, he talks a little bit about the Chinese Communist Party during the Cultural Revolution when looking for overseas Chinese to kind of keep, to, for funds, you know, to keep them sort of propped up and how a lot of the looked at Chinese Americans and I was just like, that's basically what happened during the gold rush in, in America. That's, you know, the, the emperors were looking for overseas Chinese to bring them gold. And that's what led to the to the exclusion acts, uh, because you know Americans were caught on to that. Um, reality is culturally. Really, it's 
Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, clearly, we had a man appreciate and patient, blah, blah, blah. Sometimes we didn't even know. The culture class continued throughout when he's staying there. Uh, uh, he talks a little, where he's talking a little bit about Whitney and uh, uh, Whitney came to America to have her baby and how she was trying to do the same sort of approach, you know, get the deeper relationship with her doctor and how that really didn't work in America because doctors don't really expect that sort of like. You know, she was taking out their sons and daughters and lavishing gifts on them of the doctor trying to get favored treatment. And really it's just kind of, you know, that we kind of regret, regard that as corruption, but they kind of regard that as democracy in China, you know. <laughs> That's the closest they get to democracy in China, you know, where people have some sort of ability to represent themselves or represent their own sort of initiatives or, or sort of objectives. Um, and they create these sort of false kind of relationships, you know, by by pandering to people or by sort of, you know, um, you know, showering them with gifts or you know, they kind of create these kind of false premise of of um, of um, kinship, I guess, or some sort of familiarity with one another, but through those means. Um, and yet, uh, there's an objective. There's this kind of this, you know, there's an objective in doing that. All right, so I think that's all we have to say about uh, Red Roulette. Uh, at least I hope it is. I hope later I don't. I'm sure I will, though. I'm sure I'll have thoughts later on that, that I wish I had put in this video, but I uh, exclude from this video. Uh, what does he say here? Uh, I noticed that many Americans seem to have a different view of friendships than they did. It was a, there was a fluffiness to American relations. An acquaintance would greet me enthusiastically and act like they were best buddies. But if I was looking for someone to be more substantial, on, if I had a nagging sense that they wouldn't be there. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that about Americans. Even we come across as we do that same sort of like, yo, we're buddies, you know, yo, yeah, we're friends and all that. And um, but you know, these people are going to kind of disappear once, like I said, once something new comes along in their life are new or more advantageous to you, to them, like they'll, you know, I've had friends, you know, like Facebook made that even more sort of pertinent, you know, oddly enough, uh, you know, friends for 30 years of my life that I grew up and dealt with as a child, you know, suddenly the slightest little thing, you know, their lives had found, taken a different path at a certain, you know, like there's this black period in everyone in my generations when Facebook did exist and didn't exist, there's kind of like a blackout period. So you find yourself catching up with a lot of people after that, and like they were not, you know, like even though you kind of, you you were a big part of their development as a person, um, suddenly they're like, you know, this slight little thing that I that gives me more, that is more pertinent to me now, uh, is more relevant, and therefore I'll throw you under the bus under any any sort of thing that would jeopardize that. You know, I, they totally didn't. Well, I'm not going to fight for you or anything like that. I'm not going to put anything on the line or make any sacrifices for you. And you kind of, you make, you know, that's how people build their lives a lot of way. But anyway, uh, Desmond Shum, uh, you know, he's, he sounds like a smart guy. He, you know, he's definitely a smart guy. I don't say that he can. And he has a, a very sort of a sensibility akin to my own. Um, you know, he reminds me of people I've met, very familiar, and I actually kind of am grateful that I've been able to sort of recall that this kind of, you know, brings me back to that. Over the last couple of years, I haven't really had a chance to sort of really sort of um, focus on my Chinese experience, my experiences in China. Um, also, this goes in a great deal about, you know, like what happened with Jack Ma, how the, you know, CCP uh, Evergrande is in here, the people who are, are you know, the CEOs of that. He's had, uh, he's had, um, you know, he's had um, business with all of these people, so uh, it's a good sort of it's a good sort of um, window into uh, sort of the more sort of intimate um, history of or intimate insight into what was going on there or what is going still going on today. It's Red Roulette, I would say, uh, take a look at it uh, if you're interested in, in sort of. Uh, the political landscape of today and that of China. But that's all for today. I uh, hope you join me next time here at the Fireside and we'll, uh, we'll chat then. Uh, 
Uh, thanks for visiting Fu Manchu.